Good morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning. Receive from the Lord and His Word and Sacrament. If you have your bulletin announcement, she'd like to ask you to please turn to that for some announcements this morning. As you can see, Altar Circle is meeting today. The meeting got postponed this week and moved to after the church service, uh, the second service today. So if you're interested in being a part of that, uh, the Altar Circle will meet back in the sacristy, back through this dark tunnel, I guess you would say, back in the corner here. There's a sacristy there. We'll be meeting there at 12 o'clock. Uh, speaking of meetings, the <clears throat> excuse me, LYF will be meeting uh, today for their monthly meeting at 12 o'clock. And my assumption is the Fellowship Hall, right, Dan, Diane and Amanda? Yep, so it'll be... LYF meeting uh, in the fellowship hall following the second service. Now it says Pastor Richard on vacation on Monday. Uh, just a brief mention, I've moved my days off to Saturdays, and uh, so then I will be in the office on Mondays, except for this Monday. No school in Surrey, so I'm taking the day off with the family on Mondays. So keep that in mind. Now as we look to Tuesday, we're back on schedule for men's Bible study. Now it says Matins service for the Winkle. Uh, we are hosting uh, the circuit gathering. Now, the word winkle, you may say, say to yourself, what does winkle mean? It's a German word. Um, exact translation, I, boy, Pastor Roth, exact translation of winkle, is it the gathering in German? Corner gathering, okay. Winkle, right? <laughs> so that'll be uh, all the pastors are coming here for a monthly meeting. Now, there's a service here at 10 o'clock, a matin service that is open to everyone, so there's no such thing as private church services, so that's open to anybody who might be interested in coming. So if you want to come and sing the matin prayers uh, with the other pastors of the circuit, you can do so at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Ladies' Bible study continues as well on Tuesday. And as we look to the rest of the week here, we want to just to make a brief mention. We're back on schedule for next Sunday and so forth. There's some information on the back of the bulletin, too, as well as the trustee meetings. Uh, there's been a change in adjustment to schedule for the trustees. And there is a quarterly voters meeting scheduled for January 31st at 12 o'clock. And uh, my, uh, my understanding is there will be some food provided for that um, on the 31st. So keep that in mind as well. Are there any other announcements that I may have missed that need to be mentioned at this time? Well, today is Epiphany 2, the second week after Epiphany. And we are hearing from several texts. The gospel text, namely being the one where Jesus goes and changes water to wine. But today we're going to take a special look at the epistle, the epistle which is coming from Romans chapter 12. And when Jesus, or excuse me, not when Jesus, but when Paul talks about loving your enemies. We'll hear more about that in the sermon here this morning. But before we do so, our opening hymn of invocation is hymn number 644, hymn number 644.
Ask the congregation to please stand as we turn to 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all of my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by the virtue of my office as, a, office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this stand, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue with the introit printed on the inside of your bulletin, sung to the tune of C. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name, give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come bringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds towards the children of men. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Congregation may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after the Epiphany is from Exodus chapter 33. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Romans Chapter 12. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Holy Gospel from St. John, the second chapter. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, 
What does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it had come, where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. With one heart and one voice, we confess our faith as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being a one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn number 408, hymn number 408. In the name of Jesus, amen. Congregation may be seated.
We're often picky and choosy when it comes to extending love, no doubt about it. We're picky and we are choosy in how we extend love to others. For example, it is easy to love someone that loves us in the first place. It is also easy to love someone that gives us good things. So it makes sense that you can find love often in a church. Since Christians, you, yes, all of you, possess the same faith, well, churches, they often come together and form a loving family, where Christians try to put each other first. It is not uncommon to see Christians trying to play, as they say, second fiddle. Yes, second fiddle in the church, lifting each other up as if there's a some sort of competition to see who can outdo each other in showing honor and love to one another. Like it has already been stated, it is easy to love someone that loves you first, and it is easy to love someone that gives you good things. However, what about loving those who do not give us good things? How about loving those who persecute us? Perhaps those outside the church. Perhaps those who are against the church. How about loving those people? In Romans 12, our epistle reading from this morning, Paul tells you and me to not only love Christians inside the church, but then he directs you and me to love those outside the church. He calls you and me to love, get this, to love our enemies, to love those, and to bless those who persecute and hurt us. Now, just to make sure we are clear with who our enemies are, it is important to keep in mind the original audience that Paul was writing to in our epistle reading from Romans. You see, Paul was writing to the Christians in Rome. And these Roman Christians, well, they had a government that would often suppress unofficial religions like Christianity. That is to say, the Roman Christians would often experience prejudice and unfair treatment by the Roman state, During that first century, well, Christians were banished by the state and even executed for their faith. We famously remember hearing about Nero, the emperor, Nero, yes, Nero, lighting up the city of Rome with crucified Christians on crosses, burning to death. Yes, tragic. And so Paul is telling the Christians in Rome to not only put up with that Roman state, but to to love Roman rulers, to love oppressive Roman rulers. For example, if a magistrate spoke poorly about the Christian faith, well, that magistrate, well, he deserves love from the Christian. If a ruler harasses a Christian and puts them in jail, well, that Christian is to bless that ruler, to pray to God on behalf of that ruler. Now, keep in mind, does this mean that we Christians are to be a bunch of wimpy and powerless doormats letting everyone walk over us? No, by no means. By no means. These readings from Romans 12, this reading from Romans 12 is not condemning self-defense or telling us that we should not be as wise as a serpent with respect to governing authorities, with respect to enemies before us. Loving and blessing an enemy is not the same thing as being an ignorant, foolish doormat, allowing ongoing abuse and violence to oneself. Furthermore, we must keep in mind, loving and blessing an enemy is not the same as agreeing with the enemy. To love an enemy is not the same as endorsing their actions or agreeing with their agendas or supporting their ideologies. Now, I do not have to tell you that we have really, we've really messed this up in America right now. Sure, we are good at loving those who are part of our own political tribe, that is for sure. However, perhaps the greatest sin according to our culture right now is to show love to our enemies. You see, it is viewed as an act of betrayal or an endorsement of an enemy. We certainly do not have much mercy for those who are different from us right now, no doubt about it. But my friends, no matter how much persecution arises from our enemies, no matter how unbearable the heights of their persecution, we must never stop wishing our enemies wellness. We must never stop loving our enemies and praying for them. We have to hear this very loud. 
And we have to hear it very clear this morning. We understand that love is showing kindness to those who are, who are our friends. And we understand that love is often expressed by not returning an evil action to those who have done evil to us. However, this is not all that the Apostle Paul is teaching us this morning. It is not what Jesus teaches us about love itself. God's word tells us that we are to love and to bless our enemies, to pray for them and to wish them happiness. Now, if you're like me, yes, if you're like me, you must confess right now that this does not feel right. It does not feel right. I don't even like preaching this, to be honest. But nonetheless, this is what Christ says. This is what Paul says. You see, I find it easy to love my friends. It is also easy to show love by not getting even with an enemy. You can withhold that to a certain extent. But to love and to bless an enemy? I'll be very honest. My sinful nature, my old Adam, can't stand this idea. Deep down, my old Adam, and get this, your old Adam too, wants the destruction, the damnation of our enemies. Anger comes along. and It gets the best of us. And we rage with bitterness towards our enemies. We can even envision their destruction as we dream about that destruction that they so-called deserve. Who doesn't like to watch a good movie from time to time and see when that villain gets what's coming for him? We revel and we, 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 we love to see that. When enemies get what is coming for them, well, we chuckle with sinful delight. We are happy when our enemies are destroyed. But why? But Why? You see, dear friends, we like to draw a line. We do. We like to draw lines between good and evil. Now, please, please, please hear me very clearly this morning. There is indeed a line, and there is indeed a difference between good and evil. There is a line between good and evil. They cannot be mixed. Evil is not good, and good is not evil. However, to the point, We like to draw a line through all sorts of things to distinguish good and evil according to our desires. For example, we draw a line between countries. This country is good, and this country is evil. We draw lines between political parties. This political party is evil. This political party is good. We draw a line between economic classes. Those making this certain amount of money, well, they are evil. And those making this amount of money, well, those people, they are good. We also draw lines between ethnicities and gender and generations, classifying certain genders and certain races and generations as good and others as evil. Now, after we draw all these lines, we then do this. We show love to the side that is most like us. And we begin to hate those who are on the other side of the line because they are obviously evil. Now, While this is problematic, the real problem with this kind of thinking is this. We place the line between all these different classifications. When we do this, we begin to see the other people on the other side of the line as less human. After all, they are supposedly evil. And as we see those on the other side, the other side of that line as less human Well, we then feel justified in our hatred towards them and their destruction. And instead of looking at the line and seeing the people on the other side and praying for them, well, we spend our time marinating in our hate and dreaming of their destruction. We place them outside the category of God's creation, making them into mere animals. We place them outside of the grace of Christ, as if Christ's arm did not stretch. His arms did not stretch wide enough for their redemption. This kind of line drawing and thinking, to be frank, is demonic. Yes, it is demonic. My dear friends, hear this loud and clear. The line separating good and evil does not pass through countries. It does not pass through political parties, economic classes, ethnicities, genders, and generations. No, the line... It passes through every human heart. It passes through my heart and yours too. Now this does not mean that part of your heart is somehow good and the other half is bad. No, it means that your sinful nature within you 
is on the opposite side of good, just like everyone else's. There's no difference between you and your neighbor with respect to the line. Your country, your politics, your finances, your ethnicity, your gender and age do not somehow push you over the line to the other side of good. Keep in mind what Paul teaches us here in our epistle reading and elsewhere in the book of Romans, that there is, get this, no one good, not even one. Yes, not even one. We are all together on the side of the line labeled evil. We have this sinful nature. This is why we pray for our enemies. This is why we wish them happiness. They are just like us, and we like them. You see, we know the evil in our own hearts, and we want our neighbor and our enemies to realize the evil in their hearts so that we all together might receive forgiveness, life, and salvation from Christ as we are on our knees repenting of all of our sins, begging for mercy. And so when your enemy does something evil, my friends, repent. Yes, repent when your enemy does evil because you know that the evil that they have just committed springs forth from a sinful heart, the same sinful heart that you and I have and possess. Yes, we repent when we see evil and we pray for our enemies. We cling to the forgiveness of Jesus. We cry out, Lord, have mercy on me and my neighbor and especially my enemies. We confess boldly, come Lord Jesus, set things right. Come Lord Jesus, set things right with this sinful humanity. Indeed, we pray that our enemies would be delivered from their deception. We pray that they would be brought to their knees in sorrow. We pray that they would join us in confessing that we are all poor, miserable sinners in thought, word, and deed. But there's plenty of room before the throne of God for repentant sinners. Never forget, there's always more grace in Christ than there is sin in us and our enemies. And so, dear baptized saints, if it is possible, keep peace with everyone around you while constantly praying for your enemies. However, remember that you do not keep peace at all costs. There will be times, mark this, there will be times when truth, when duty... And justice demand that you and I defend ourselves from others. When this happens, we stand firm. We rest in Christ. And we pray for those who attack us. And when you are persecuted for your faith, never forget the victory of Christ that though you were once an enemy of God, Christ Jesus made you his own through his death and his resurrection. And through Christ erasing that line, to reconcile you to God the Father as a sheer gift. Never forget that you have been forgiven for the enemy that lurks within your heart, your old Adam. And so may God grant you and me the humility. It's the humility to see ourselves no better than those around us. May God grant you and me love to serve our neighbor. May God grant you and me the posture of grace to pray and bless those around us, especially our enemy. May God grant us the integrity, and the duty to stand for truth when so called to do so. May God grant us his grace, forgiveness, life, and salvation. In the name of Jesus, amen. As the congregation, please stand for the offertory.
congregation, maybe see it for the offering. As a way of reminder, the offering plate is at the back of the sanctuary. Offerings can also be mailed into the church office or conducted online on the church website. ask the congregation to please stand for the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, you have manifested your glory in the sign given at Cana. You have restored creation through the shedding of Christ's blood and now give us your grace in abundance. Give us joy and gladness in the revelation of your truth in the person of your Son, Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, you blessed the wedding at Cana with your presence and honored it with your first miracle. Strengthen and give your gladness to all married couples and their families. Be present in our homes and lives with your free and abundant forgiveness. And preserve us in the true faith from each generation to the next. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, preserve in wisdom our nation and our leaders, especially Joseph, our president-elect, Kamala, our vice president-elect, Doug, our governor, and all public servants, including our armed forces, police, and first responders. Send peace in our time, Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, you are the great physician of the body and soul. Give rest, healing, and relief to all who are sick or in any need, especially we pray for Tim and Ashley, Butch, Carl, Charlotte, Darcy, David, Dennis, Dory, Aaron, George, Gloria, Janice, Jeff, Janice, Joellen, Justin, Lars, Lavon, Marilyn, Melissa, Philip, Rita, Sue, Tim, and Tom. Be with all expected mothers and their children. Invite them all, invite them and us to cast all anxiety on you and so live in the certainty of your steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that of your grace you have instituted holy matrimony in which you keep us from unchastity and other offenses. We beseech you to send your blessing upon every husband and wife that they may not provoke each other to anger and strife, but to live peacefully together in love and godliness. Receive your gracious help in all temptations and rear their children in accordance with your will. Grant us all to walk before you in purity and holiness Put all of our trust in you and lead such lives on earth that in the world to come we may have everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue to the service of the sacrament on page 194, and as we continue, we Receive the gifts of the Lord's life-giving body and blood in repentance and, faith, repentance and faith this day. If you're not a member of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Center, one of our sister congregations, we do still invite you to please come forward, kneel, and cross your arms to receive a blessing at the rail today. And if you'd like to partake of this wonderful gift of the altar, please talk to me after the service about membership here at St. Paul's. Also, as a way of reminder, I ask you to please space at the rail as we receive God's gifts this day. We continue on 194. 
the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly right, meet right and salutary, that we should at all times, all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him, being found the substance of our mortal nature, you manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Taught by Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Ask the congregation to please stand for the Nunc de Medis on page 199. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Maybe see it for our departing hymn, hymn number 507, hymn number 507.
the apostle, the apostle Paul teaches us elsewhere in scripture that due to our sinful nature, we are technically enemies with God, but thanks be to God for Jesus Christ who came and bled and died to reconcile, to make us friends with God. That is our hope today. It is also our prayer for enemies that through repentance of faith that there is reconciliation for them too as well. We are in Christ, rest in Christ. We stand firm in Christ. We trust in Jesus who is for us, who has made us friends with God. Amen.